Hi, welcome to History Respawn. Let's play the past. This is John Harney from Centre College playing Civilization V. For those of you who um, are coming from the Archive Part 1 or might have joined us yesterday, uh, welcome back. The uh, main idea here is to play Civilization V as China and to talk about it a little bit. So I'm going to load up the game that I had yesterday. I move things on a little bit um, from yesterday. Um, I move the calendar up a little bit. I talked a bit yesterday about the kind of the issue of anachronisms in Civilization V, and there's a couple of different ways that that um, kind of manifests itself. One of the ways is, uh, you know, the kind of classic having nuclear weapons versus chariots type thing. The other is trying to keep up with the calendar, and so what I find when I personally play Civilization games is that I can be comfortably ahead of, you know, the agricultural revolution. Well, I guess you can't be because you start after that, but comfortably ahead of very, very early updates, and then before I know it, I'm lagging behind. Um, and that's kind of typical, and that's kind of interesting from, when I start, from an historian's point of view, this kind of these different anachronisms and these different ways of uh, approaching the game. So. What I did um, was I moved the calendar up a little bit to um, 640 BC, and I did that because we are now considerably closer to um, the time of Confucius. And I figured that was basically, you know, a good thing to talk about. So here I am at the moment for the current state of affairs. I got my two Chinese cities, Xi'an and Chang'an, two kind of great Chinese capitals of the imperial period. And we are moving now towards um, basically the period during which the Qin state is established, Q-I-N, which is one of the kind of early uh, major, um, kind of the first major um, empire. And I'll talk about that in just a moment. Um, between now and then, um, we have Confucius. So as we enter the 6th century BC, um, we enter the period of Confucius. And I think, you know, this is a man that a lot of people have heard a lot about, but... Um, Maybe you don't know that much about who he was. Um, he was an historical figure. He is, of course, the origin of the philosophy of Confucianism, um, which is a moral philosophy, essentially, which sought to uh, kind of give a pathway to Chinese people to a more peaceful time. Here I'm with masonry. When I was playing in between the live streams, I kind of added a couple of more practical uh, research spots. That's out of third city. I'm going to name this city... Chengdu, which isn't really any kind of an historical thing, but it's inland. Chengdu is in Sichuan in real life. Let's go ahead, go ahead and call it that. And let's see what we have. Let's build a granary. Why not? So getting back to Confucius, um, this time period in uh, Chinese history is known th uh, as the Eastern Zhou, and it contains two very famous periods, the Spring and Autumn period and the Age of Warring States. And the uh, both periods, although the Age of Warring State say it sounds very violent, both periods are actually very violent, and um, Confucius grew up in a pretty violent and hostile environment. I'm going to go with uh, construction here. And he grew up at a time when China, as we know it, it basically consisted of a lot of modern-day north-central China, and there were lots of small, kind of isolated states called vassal states. And at the time, you see... Um, there was a king of the Zhou who was nominally kind of respected or nominally recognized as the lord of all Chinese, but it didn't really translate into actual political control. What you did have, though, was some kind of common sense of, if not a China, then certainly kind of a shared cultural identity, um, which we sometimes refer to as Hua Xia. And this led to there kind of basically being a prize for people. There was like a motivation to unify China. And so there's lots and lots of conflict, lots of wars happening, lots of um, violence being enacted out, especially on regular people. So the regular people really lost out here because they weren't getting anything out of it, um, you know, except being called up into armies, ad hoc, of course, medieval style, or um, just being the victims of raiding partings, being the victims of rapes and things like that. Here we are, Consul Harold Bluetooth. Well, as we said in the last game, the Civilization V uh, world map doesn't really try and pair you up in realistic locations. So I don't know how I ended up near the Vikings. Let's just let's just leave him alone for now and say goodbye. 
It's my first, my first civilization to be encountered. So Confucius lived during um, a very violent time. Hey, we're wonderful. Lived during a very violent time, and um, a lot of kind of the philosophy that, in fact, all of the philosophy that he becomes famous for, is really dominated by this desire to, um, to for harmony, basically. So he grows up in this very violent period. And the reason that the first half of the period of the Eastern Zhou is called the Spring and Autumn period is because Confucius isn't the only great thinker that is born during this time. In fact, in history, we talk about it as a hundred schools of thought, which in Chinese, when you say a hundred like that, it doesn't literally mean a hundred. It means kind of an overflowing number of things. Um, and so Confucianism was joined by Mohism, which is the school of thought centered on the famous philosopher Mo Tzu. Um, the famous philosopher Mencius lived during this time, um, just you know, a few couple of generations after Men after Confucius himself. Mencius is one of the great early Confucian scholars, and one of only three men to be called master in the classical Chinese texts alongside Confucius himself, and the much much later master Zhu Xi. Um, let's leave the Vikings alone and, and hack these barbarians here. And um, so it was kind of very paradoxically a very violent time, but also a time when some of the most famous philosophies in the history of mankind were created. And those philosophies, as a result, were extremely focused on the idea of how to solve these problems, or at the very least, what a future without these problems would look like. And so Confucius, Confucian philosophy is really centered and focused on the idea of harmony and achieving you know, peace, essentially, and achieving a common peace in the future. Now, that's... Um, a big deal because you might see this term Confucian used you might see it referenced uh, especially in kind of Western um, you know American and European um, you know newspapers um, if anyone reads those anymore you know, online newspapers and so on where you'll often see this kind of term Confucian society or Confucian state used so I was talking to my students about this in class yesterday and I asked them if they'd ever heard this term used and one student said oh yeah sure with Singapore I thought that was a great example because Singapore is a society where you can um, you can be arrested and you can be caned or have some other fairly egregious punishment for chewing gum in the street. Um, Singapore is also a society that did very well economically, uh, one of the great tiger economies of the latter half of the 20th century, but um, is also, um, you know, did that largely on the back of a, if not authoritarian, very much kind of rigidly... Um, sorry, excuse me, kind of rigidly centralist rule, I suppose. Certainly not democratic, and certainly not democratic in the American sense or, or Western European sense. So, um, you know, there, there's, this is the rap that Confucian, Confucianism usually gets in the West, and particularly back in the Tiananmen Square incident when the Chinese government sent troops in to put down uh, students, um, you know, there was kind of a there was some discussion in the West why why doesn't China democratize in the way that Poland democratized and other countries in the quote unquote Eastern Bloc had democratized um, you know in later on that year and one of the answers was well maybe the Chinese lack a political tradition and there's kind of two ways to look at it um, you can make the I would argue far too simplistic and kind of essentialist statement that Chinese societies quote unquote are not suited to democracy. You can also make a much more sophisticated argument that um, they lack a political tradition, which is a different thing, is a different thing to say. Either way, um, I think Confucianism kind of gets a slightly harsh rap. So at the time of his life, which is actually now by 240 BC, he's long dead, Confucius was focused on this idea of, of harmony and of society coming together. And it's where we get this slightly oversimplified idea that in China, people think of the group, and in America and Britain and so on, they think about the, they think about the individual. Uh, let's go for a let's go for a wonder here before somebody catches me. Um, if you weren't here yesterday or on Tuesday, you won't have heard me say that I'm pretty much a shocking uh, player at Civ Five, and it's really hard to play these games while talking. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, try and um, just pick something without kind of shutting down too much which is unfortunately exactly what's happening, so I'm just going to pick the Colossus. Um, so there is some truth, however, to the idea that the group or a social kind of well-being is more important in East Asia and in Confucian societies. And Confucius himself um, argued very strongly for um, interpersonal kind of communication, and in particular, an individual cultivation of one's kind of participation in society. <clears throat> 
And that was, a, you know, this was a really big deal. And so, in particular, one of the common kind of manifestations of this in um, East Asia today is the concept of face. Um, basically, uh, the idea that losing face is this massive, massive social problem and can very much negatively affect um, individual relationships. And, and, and it can. Um, and a lot of this goes back to this kind of Confucian idea that each of us has an individual responsibility to maintain those relationships, to make ourselves better people, and that if we all do that, then our society will become better. Now, um, one of the downsides of, of Confucius's ideas is that he was very, very conservative. And so um, he very much believed that you kind of, you should know your place um, and that um, you, um, you know, that a prince is a prince, that, um, you know, and a, a kind of a, you know, a poor man is a poor man. It resulted in very specific ways of looking at women's relationships in society, which, is, which could be problematic and was problematic for centuries afterwards and arguably still is today. But, like I said, the positive and one of the big reasons he proved so popular is he was very good at kind of identifying something that, that people wanted, which was uh, essentially, you know, peace. Um, in his own lifetime, he wasn't all that successful. But after his death, his ideas proved to be enduring, proved to be very, very popular indeed. And so Confucius ended up, you know, being this kind of this father of this massive kind of cultural cultural slash political system. Um, in particular, uh, you know, and I should say before I move on as well, the Confucius did not see himself as an innovator. Rather, he saw himself as a transmitter or an interpreter. So he's very famous for the five core classics, which include the Book of Odes and the Book of Documents, which is which are respectively a collection of poetry and songs and a collection of history. And what Confucius said was, we're living in a dark age and China used to be this glorious place and I have I have recovered the documents, I've recovered the history and I have evidence that we were a great society. And so that was very appealing to people as well that he wasn't necessarily saying, I've had a new idea that we should all follow. He was basically arguing that, you know, listen, China has all these great things, um, it has uh, these great things traditionally and we must simply recover them. I'm gonna go with piety here because we're talking about Confucius and Confucius was a huge believer in filial piety, honoring your parents and ancestor worship and the rest. Now the time period we're at here in the game right now um, was covered in real life by the Han Dynasty, which ran from about 206 BC to 220 AD. Very, very successful dynasty in Chinese history. One of the more famous dynasties. There are basically kind of five, there's many, many dynasties in Chinese history, but there's five core history uh, dynasties that are worth focusing on. Uh, and the Han is the first of those. Uh, they're followed by the, um, the Tang, the Song, the Ming, and the Qing. And we'll talk about those either later this episode or in a future episode. And the Han period is sometimes referred to by historians as quote unquote, the victory of Confucianism because it was during the Han period Let's go for, do we need to set, let's go for the Great Wall, why not? Let's see if we can do it. See, I told you I wasn't good at this game. Um, so the Han period is sometimes called the victory of Confucianism. They created um, official libraries within which they kept Confucius's texts. Confucian morals, such as they were, began to become a standard for um, enlistment in the civil service, and this would morph over the following centuries into a civil service exam based entirely on um, the idea of, you know, being fluent, as it were, in Confucian texts and being able to memorize them and repeat them and, and use them to answer problems. So the classic kind of example, you know, the, 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 um, the emperor would get up at dawn and meet with his Confucian counselors and he would ask them for advice, you know, what do I do about these Christian missionaries? What do I do about these Mongols coming on my northern border? And his advisors would say, well, of course, you know, to cite the Spring and Autumn Annals, the master said this. To cite the Analects, the master said this. Like, they, they really used Confucianism on a day-to-day -day basis and cited it regularly. And this lasted until the civil service exams were swept away in 1905. 1905. And when the Qing dynasty abdicated in 1912, that was kind of the final end of that particular kind of uh, Confucian tradition. So, um, massive impact beyond his lifetime, in no small part thanks to the Han Dynasty. And as I mentioned, the Han Dynasty was a period when, in which there were cultural um, achievements, in which um, Confucianism kind of, kind of became an official ideology of the state in some ways. That happens in a much more in-depth way um, a few hundred years later in the Song. And Confucianism also began to incorporate ideas from other Chinese philosophies, such as Taoism, for example, um, the Tao, the Way, with a capital W, and began to become, you know, more fluid, I suppose. 
because this is something to be thinking about when it comes to Asia, when it comes to religions and philosophies and the like, is that um, people had fluid understandings of how religion, philosophy, social life interacted. One of the things you have when Westerners um, kind of interact with um, East Asia, and I'm talking here about, you know, particularly Western missionaries who would reach China in the 1500s, uh, is that um, especially Western Christians, and of course especially medieval Western Christians, had a very clear idea of what role religion had in people's lives and, 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 and where, the, where the boundaries were, for lack of a better word. And they had trouble understanding how the Chinese participated uh, in religion in that sense, because from an early point, um, people would do things that you would, would practice certain things that you would associate with, you know, a religious practice. So they might worship a Buddhist bodhisattva. They might worship, um, they might go to a Confucian temple. They may go and see a fortune teller quite frequently to ask for his for his advice on, on what to do next. Um, but that didn't necessarily mean they fit, they didn't necessarily fit neatly into a kind of a specific, this is what, quote unquote, a Buddhist looks like. Sorry, let me edit this. I'm now officially just, it's becoming a bizarre in-joke with me that I'm just refusing to have a city called Beijing. I will eventually have a city called Beijing. But let's go ahead and have a coastal city here. So, um, and you know, Westerners, especially the Western missionaries that got out there, they found it hard to deal with. They, they, didn't, they weren't sure how to categorize it and, and kind of, you know, this was how they thought about these things. They thought about them in terms of categorization. And it's not really that surprising if you think about it. You know, the Jesuits who were so important in spreading ideas to East Asia and in spreading Christianity to East Asia, the Jesuits were, were founded among, you know, amidst the, um, the Reformation, right? Um, the Counter-Reformation, I should say. And so, you know, you have this kind of... Um, they're coming from a political and religious situation where these boundaries are very, very harsh. And so it's kind of hard for them to understand. In particular, one of the long running problems you have, and my current research focuses on this in the 20th century, is the difficulties of extricating a Confucian identity or Confucian concepts from a Chinese identity or Chinese concept. And this all goes back to his lifetime in the 6th century BC, and particularly the Han period that we're kind of uh, actually coming to the end of now quite quickly. As I mentioned, we're now reaching this point where um, in the game, um, we are now beginning to massively catch up chronologically, and I will soon be completely, completely anachronistic. Um, so the Han, so the Han have about a century left, according to our uh, calendar up here. So um, if the Han were so great, and if the Han were so cultured and so powerful militarily, and all these things are true, what happened to them? There's a lot of different kind of things, obviously, that come into the collapse of a dynasty. But in particular, the Han dynasty saw the rise of estates, that is to say, certain um, important families and important individuals gathered large properties, um, you know, especially from kind of the you know, time of Christ or beginning of the common era onwards. And as we got closer to the end of the second century AD, these groups became much more powerful. They um, ended up outside the realm of the Chinese tax base. And I always tell my students this, you know, Taxation doesn't exactly sound like the sexiest topic imaginable, but when you think of tax, especially for a government this early in human development, tax is really vital. I mean, first of all, tax gathers resources that you can use, and tax um, also is an indicator for historians of, um, you know, what power the state had. Was it able to carry out good censuses? Could it distribute its resources in a meaningful way? You'll have to excuse me. I'll be back in just a moment. I'm terribly sorry about this. I'll be back in just a moment. 
Terribly sorry about that. Uh, I was needed fatherly duties, my apologies. So I was talking about the um, ever sexy topic of taxation. Hey, here's Consul Askia of the Songhai. So like we said a minute ago, I'll come back to taxation in a minute. This is actually really interesting. So not sure where the Songhai are placed on the map just yet. But um, the Songhai, of course, are a very prominent African civilization in kind of the kind of western part of Africa, just to the south of the Saharan Desert. And uh, if we have some more interactions with the Songhai, I will definitely be happy to talk about them a little bit more. Um, very much benefited from the trading routes across the Sahara, as I just said, um, and kind of were one of these civilizations that saw kind of the emergence of uh, Muslim Africa, of course, much, much later in the 9th, 10th centuries and much, much later than that. So as I was saying about taxation, um, the reason taxation is important is because it tells us as historians, okay, we understand this state had a credible enough kind of infrastructure to carry out censuses, to, um, to be able to tell who could pay what um, in their society, um, how much they should charge, um, and kind of what they needed to raise militaries and everything else. And so one of the earliest examples of direct taxation by the state comes in uh, around the time of Confucius in the 7th century BC, um, but certainly at this time, um, you know, it, 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 it's a big deal. And so what happens is, as the estates go beyond the reach of the Han tax system, that effectively puts them beyond the reach of Han power. And the collapse of Han power is so significant and so traumatic, really, for the Chinese state that um, it leads actually to a very long period of kind of civil war and unrest called the period of division. There are many, many dynasties, there are the five dynasties that you might hear about in the Chinese history class that actually covers the, um, the, Chinese, the dynasties of northern, the northern part of China. This is a time, time period that gives birth to, or that inspires one of the most famous novels ever written, Romance of the Three Kingdoms, that is set just after the fall of the Han. Uh, in fact, one of the main characters, or one of the main protagonists, I should say, historical figures in that story, is kind of trying to revive the Han or to safeguard the Chinese dynasty. It doesn't work. And the Han Dynasty, um, the collapse of the Han Dynasty has a, a number of pretty serious effects. So for one thing, for a couple of centuries, China is seriously fragmented, politically speaking at least. Secondly, it definitely, definitely impacts the um, prestige of Confucianism. Because I did mention the Han period is kind of seen as this victory for Confucianism. And so the defeat of the Han in many ways is, is a defeat for Confucianism. And so... The Buddhism, which had arrived in China in the first century AD, really kind of re receives a fillip from this, and, and Buddhism becomes more influential than it previously had. So much so that when the Tang Dynasty is formed at the beginning of the seventh century AD, that I'll talk about probably in the next episode, um, the Tang Tang China is effectively a Buddhist state in a way that China is not a religious state um, prior to that. And I'm now officially getting ridiculous with my renamings of cities. I'll call this one Nanjing, Southern Capital. Now I'm just now I'm just teasing Beijing completely. So um, the Caps of the Ham is a really big deal. Um, it also gives us one of our first examples as historians when we talk about something in Chinese history called the dynastic cycle. And what that essentially is, it's a broad idea that um, the Chinese dynasties, generally speaking, had a fairly standard kind of routine development from um, being... Uh, expanding early on, in particular expanding alongside pretty significant military um, growth and military performance, to becoming, um, uh, to kind of reaching this zenith, of course, where the population began to grow as well, and then uh, economic military growth stagnated, followed by a stagnation of economic growth, and then they lost control of their tax base and lost control of the general population, and the society began to crumble internally, particularly due to factionalism. And that's pretty much exactly what happened to the Han. So um, from the 3rd century until the very, very late 6th century AD, China, although it's still home to a very sophisticated culture, um, is very much not... Um, what's what I'm looking for? Sorry. <laughs> is, uh, it's, not a, it's not a regional power in the way that it'll be later. Oh, hi, Katie. Hello. Sorry, I didn't see you earlier. Um, thanks for joining us. So... Um, yeah, sorry, so that's kind of it. That's kind of the fall of the Han. So let me just pick what I'm going to do here for this guy. I'm just going to build granaries, because uh, being the inexperienced Civ player that I am, I'm just going to play. Gra I'm going to build granaries all over the place. I'll be a nation of grain. Um, 
so that's it. So what I'd like to do actually just for the last kind of few minutes of this particular short little episode is to talk about um, perhaps more generally um, just kind of something I'd like to come back to and talk about in more detail in the next episode. Kind of the extent to which Civilization V kind of maybe and Civilization games kind of retrench Western ideas of history. And I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not going to get super postmodern political about it, um, at least not this time, but just to kind of talk a little bit about, just for a couple of minutes, about how it does emphasize kind of the way we look at history in the Western world, um, which of course is natural because it's a game made by Westerners and, and it follows kind of Western theories of history and everything else. I mentioned, I think, in the last episode, there is kind of an issue, I suppose, with um, Civ in that, you know, there's definitely this intention or or rather the game kind of naturally sends you into a space where you're fighting others and that's just kind of the way it is and I I think there's an interesting discussion there as to is that because of the nature of a video game or is that because of it kind of being a western construction and the focus on military conflicts and western historiographies Um, of course anybody watching or listening who is familiar with other cultures historiographies could equally point out it's not like the west is the only group that focuses on these particular ideas so here we have Genghis Khan, the great Khan of Mongolia, Temujin, which is his birth name. So this is cool. This is a group I could actually talk about a little bit as well. Let's see if they'll open their borders so I can cut across his land and keep settling. Um, trade, I guess. Open borders. And I will give him open borders. Unacceptable. All right, Genghis. Jeez. Um, the Mongols, of course, conquered the Chinese in the uh, 13th century. In 1234, one of my favorite dates, because it's super easy to remember, uh, they penetrated down into the southern part of China, and Genghis Khan's grandson, Kublai Khan, ended up being emperor of China. And that's definitely a story that we we will certainly talk about um, in a future episode. The only time China has been fully conquered by a foreign power. And of course, in classic Chinese style, um, they kind of consumed and subsumed and sinified the Mongols, and the Mongols ended up ruling over what essentially was a Chinese empire, although I'm, I'm, I'm terribly oversimplifying there, and I look forward to talking about that in more detail. Looks like my scout's in a bit of a dead end there, if they're not going to let him through. So yeah, the question to which um, civilization, and perhaps no more than textbooks, no more than Western textbooks, is going to take a certain kind of an approach. Um, I often talk to my students about this, because of course all my classes are in Asian history, and we talk about things like, are there certain things that we stress? Are there certain things that, you know you know, how do these things impact the kind of product that it is? Yeah, Katie comments there, thanks Katie, that, you know, it's really interesting how the developers can skew the way the game goes, and I think that definitely happens consciously, I think it happens subconsciously, I think it just depends, Um, and I think it's only natural. You know, I start my, so I teach a survey class, which I'm teaching right now, and I start off by telling my students, you know, I get them to read a section of a book called What is History by E.H. Carr. Now, this is this is a book for history nerds, I think. I don't know if What is History by E.H. Carr is good bedside reading for some people, but some of you might really like it. It's a very short book. It's 100 pages. It's really excellent, and he talks about things like inherent bias when it comes to being an historian. And this is written back in the early 1960s. I mean, this is it was actually based on lectures that he gave, and it's really kind of he's really kind of ahead of his time, and he's very famous in the introduction to that book for talking about... Um, an historian and his facts and it's a very very good chapter um it's actually sorry it's not the introduction it's the first chapter and he talks about this idea of an historian being a fisherman and facts being the fish and he opens this idea of up of um you know the history that you make it's very much a case of you know you have the fish and you're going to choose how to dress the fish how to butcher the fish and what dish you're going to cook you're going to fry the fish you're going to bake the fish you're going to chop it up what are you going to do and he goes on at the end of the chapter to go into slightly more detail about that and basically argue and basically say that um, it's actually more than that. It's not about finding the fish on your kitchen table, as it were. It's about being the fisherman who goes out into the sea. So you're limited by what you can actually pick up, you know. You're limited by what fish you end up catching. And some of that will be your own design. Maybe you're a good fisherman, it's your skills. And some of it will just be what's available. And some of it will be the fish that kind of put themselves in a position to get caught. And when you think about the different kinds of history and how um, particularly the further back you go, the less sources we have to deal with, it's a really interesting analogy that makes you kind of think about these things. And I talk to my students 
students and I encourage them. I say, I want you guys to think about who you are as a person and how that influences you. So I'm currently working on a research project about Catholic priests in China in the 1920s, 1930s, and I myself happen to be Roman Catholic. So I think quite a lot about, um, you know, the identity of these men that I'm studying. And what I've found when I talk to my colleagues about, you know, the project and the work and the writing that I'm doing, my colleagues often encourage me and they ask me to ease up because what's happening is I'm being a little bit too hard on the subjects of my research because I'm so eager to um, avoid a problematic bias, like maybe going too easy on them because I have sympathy for them because I personally am ha- a religious person and and the same religion as them. Um, but I'm actually pushing it too far when it's okay to give them some kind of credit. I basically write about cultural imperialism right from the off. And as my colleagues say to me, listen, that's great and that's an interesting topic, but it kind of seems like you have an axe to grind because you get right to it. And so getting back to the point, you know, you know, Kate, he mentioned there that it's interesting, this idea of these developers having a focus on it. There's no question that you do. Um, and it doesn't always have to be a problem either. I think it's just something to recognize. But, you know... Um, in America right now, lots of conversations about diversity and the benefits of diversity. I'm just basically saying that it shouldn't really be surprising that games made in Japan have certain aesthetics and certain ideas and certain views of history, and games made in the West have other aesthetics. So, for example, the Yakuza series of games on the PlayStation, which is a fantastic series of games, is incredibly Japanese in ways that um, it can be a little bit hard to explain. For one thing, the genre of gangster movies has been very popular in Japan for a long time. And obviously, there are gangster movies in the West too, but the Yakuza gangster movies of Japan have their own certain kind of aesthetic to them. And even coming down to the type of gameplay and gameplay mechanics that Japanese designers tend to enjoy employing. These these things all kind of come together. Um, and so I think it's something to think about with Civ. Something maybe I'd like to do in the future on History Respond is look at some of the Paradox games, such as Crusader Kings um, and Victoria and some of those games, and maybe look at kind of different approaches to history. How do the mechanics... Um, you know, approach this, or, or, or sorry, in, 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 uh, <laughs> interpret it. So again, with Civ, you've got this really interesting interaction between, you know, I, I feel at least as a Civ fan, from iteration to iteration, there's this, you know, regular um, desire and attempt to uh, make the game more amenable to a solution other than just simple dominion. Um, in particular, there's a desire, there's a focus on making... Um, you know, a game that maybe allows you to, to win through a cultural influence or something like that. And I think that's fantastic. And I think that's, I personally think that's where the game should be going. And I think it's really, I think it makes for a better game. Um, but it also hopefully, or perhaps in theory, allows you to make different kinds of choices um, and do different kinds of things. I certainly hope so anyway. So here in the game, it looks like I'm a bit more hemmed in than I realized. So um, I've got a couple barbarians. So I think for the next game, it might be time to abandon my peacenik cultural ways and start building some warriors and getting out and fighting people um and jing's under a bit of threat there i need to break my way out as i just said i was just talking about the game having perhaps certain biases in terms of expecting you to um play the game a certain way maybe i have room here to the south maybe we'll focus on that and i can build shanghai and hong kong down here in the next episode yeah i think that's what i'll do so um these are kind of designed to be kind of short, at least here for Civ Five. I hope you found my comments on Confucius and the Han Dynasty interesting. Um, this game is shaping up nicely. I think in the next couple episodes, we're going to start getting some action. And even at this easy difficulty level, I suspect that my uh, my peace-loving Chinese um, will might be eventually obliterated by the Mongols. But let's see. I guess that would technically be historically accurate. So thank you very much for watching. Really appreciate it. Um, if you haven't heard of us before and you're stumbling across this video, please check out our channel. We've got a number of videos. We produce a full-on interview with an historian every month. Um, we've got one coming up uh, at the end of February that I'm quite excited about. Um, we've got a couple of cool videos lined up for the next couple of months. You can find us at History Respawn on Twitter. We have a website, historyrespawn.com, which in addition to just posting these videos, will also have every week um, a little post with just some links to in- history stories that have interested us that week. You can find Bob on Twitter at Whitaker Almanac. You can find me on Twitter at Prof John Harney. Um, and please feel free to drop us a line and say hello. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.